Good morning and welcome to Birchcliff Bluffs United Church on this 98th anniversary of the United Church of Canada. And today at Birchcliff Bluffs we celebrate uh, the beginning of Pride. And so we will honor those who belong to us in Toby's place or at Dorothy's place. Please follow the service as printed for us. This morning we light the Christ candle, inviting Christ into our midst. We light this pride candle, acknowledging that we are one in spirit and in truth. We join in our call to worship. Come, let us gather for worship. It is a fine day to worship God. For 98 years we have been singing, praying, preaching, serving, dreaming. For 98 years we have been listening, searching, comforting, loving, and learning. For 98 years God has been leading, guiding, cajoling, encouraging, and challenging. And so, on this 98th anniversary of our denomination, we declare... years that verse was sung in every <laughs> Protestant church every Sunday morning for service to begin our opening prayer creator God we offer this time of worship as an outpouring of gratitude for 98 years as the United Church of Canada as a community of believers we seek to love as Christ loves we seek to live as Christ lived. We strive to be faithful servants. We long for healing, recreation in our world. Amen. We now take a moment to acknowledge the sacred land beside the water on which Birchcliff Bluffs United Church stands. It has been a site of human activity for many thousands of years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Patoon First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Scugog, all part of the Williams Treaty. We are grateful for the opportunity to live and work on this territory, and we seek to be mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. We're now going to stand and join in our opening hymn.
we now hear about the life and work of the church. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we only have a couple of Sundays left. I'm sorry, I'm echoing. A uh, couple of Sundays left, and then we will be closed for July, so no services. And in August, we'll have three services that will be found online. And we will ba be back in person after Labor Day. So, just so everyone's clear what's happening. And one of those services will be... Will be Music Sundays. So that'll be on, on um, June 25th, the last Sunday of the month. And uh, we, are st we are still... There's our musical guest right there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still nailing down the, uh, the uh, performer who will be joining us, but I will know by next Sunday for you. That's two Sundays from now, the last Music Sunday of the season, on June 25th. I think well, Jason's warming up to be part of the choir. <laughs> He's certainly going to be the loudest. <laughs> A piece of information I should give you for today's service. When it's time to share in the breaking of bread and the cup, this morning, as you can see, you're going to be asked to come forward, stop at the bread station, where you will be given a piece of bread and you will consume it while you're there. Walk across the aisle where you'll be given a cup. You will drink from the cup and then there's a plate to put your empties in and you go back to your seat. Not very complicated. I think you've done it here that way before. And uh, we'll roll with it and see what happens. May we have our scripture reader. And don't worry, the people at the back, we will come to you and Randy. Our scripture this morning is Psalm 33. Uh, we are doing it. Yep, we are doing it. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the heart. Make music. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all she does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord, Lord the heavens were made. The heavens were made. <laughs> the sorry toast by the breath. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the people. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people of Jehovah's for his inheritance. And it, I realized as I got to the end of that psalm, I should have just replaced all the he's with they. He's the Trinity. It's they. Anyway. Habits die hard. Um, our gospel this morning is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13 and 18 to 26. The calling of Matthew. As Jesus went from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, 
Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with, his, with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread through all that region. The word of God for the people of God. bow for a moment of prayer. Gracious and loving creator, sustainer of all life, come. Come because we have gathered in your name and we seek to hear out of your voice and the message you have for us today. Help us open our eyes and ears and our hearts in new ways that we might understand and be a blessing to those who paths we cross. Amen. I've been struggling with this P 
piece of scripture for a few weeks now. And the one thing that kept coming to me is no matter how I looked at it, I could see the healing power of touch. And so I've woven some personal experiences in with the scripture. As Matthew's story begins this morning, Jesus is seen as the great physician and is on his way to make an emergency house call. There was a little girl and she's in a grave state and her father implores Jesus to come. We're told that there was a large crowd there and they all followed, curious to see what Jesus was going to do. Some hoped he'd be successful. Others hoped he'd fail. Most probably caught up in the excitement of the parade. In this throng was a woman who was there for quite a different reason. We're told that for 12 years, she had been suffering from a bleeding hemorrhage. Some modern scholars believe that this was a bleeding kind of cancer. And if this was the case, she was indeed beyond all medical help. Mark tells us she'd already been to doctors, she's only gotten worse, and besides that, she had run out of money. They had taken it all. Interesting, Luke, who is a physician, tells this story as well, but he could not bring himself to tell that side of the story. Call it professional pride, but he's not about to say that she was taken for all her money by a long string of doctors. But her issue today was, how could she get the attention of Jesus? Her problem was very personal and she didn't want to discuss it in public. According to the Levitic law, a woman who was bleeding was considered unclean and no one was allowed to touch her. There were many ancient taboos in those days and she did not want to have to go Jesus' disciples just to see him. She wanted the doctor himself, not a whole bunch of nurses. So she devised a plan. She knew the stories of Jesus and the power he had. And so she thought to herself, if I could just touch his garment, I know I will be healed. Today we'd smile and say, how naive. But she reaches her hand out in the midst of many, many people and touches just the hem of his robe. Immediately he stops, looks around, and he says, who touched me? Now the disciples, they're taken aback, they're a little bit confused. What kind of rhetorical question is this? Who touched you? Master, look around, everybody's trying to touch you. Jesus replied with one of the most mysterious lines in the Bible. He said, I felt the power flow from me. For years I've struggled with that verse. He felt the power flowing from him. What really, really happened in that moment? Did the lady drain his battery? It sounds as if he's almost describing a power surge. Whatever happened, what's most important is that in the midst of the crowd, Christ was able to feel a single person touch him. Don't ever say that the enormity of the cosmos God cannot care about me and my concerns. Not only does God care, he actually solicits our concerns. Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Daughter, he says, your faith has made you well. And we're told that the woman stood up and was immediately healed. The desperation of her faith became the channel that led to her healing. And as I worked with this story for a while, I began to see that there's two, ty two types of touch. The first is physical touch. 
So often when Jesus wanted to transmit his power of love, he physically touched people. The man born blind. The children of Jerusalem being two examples. An embrace. A kiss. An arm on a shoulder. A pat on the back. All of these are ways of expressing love that go beyond the words. It's lamentable that we are so paranoid on this subject in North America. We've grown touchy about touching. In other parts of the world, they don't seem to have this hang-up. To me, the guideline that we can use is from the third chapter of Ecclesiastes. You might recall the familiar verses that read, there's a time to live and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what has been planted. A time for peace and a time for war. A time for touch and a time to refrain from touching. A sage person will appreciate the difference. I lament the politically correct world that we have created where no one's allowed to touch in a professional setting. I took a course on this when I was in university and as a clergy person, we were schooled to understand if you touch anyone, it's between the wrist and the elbow, nowhere else. Isn't that interesting? The wrist and the elbow. I can tell you no minister, no teacher, no boss will ever get close to a person if he's really not allowed to touch. Touch communicates far more than words are able You'll never draw close to a person if you're unwilling to physically touch them. If you're unwilling to touch your wife, your child, your friend, your father, that can be interpreted as you don't really, really love them. In ministry, if you're not willing to touch a sick person, a homeless person, an alcoholic, or a dirty person, then it's considered no ministry that you're doing among them. I read a fascinating story. The Menninger Institute in Kansas once did a fascinating experiment. They identified a group of crib babies who did not cry. It seems that the babies cried because they instinctively know that's the way to get attention. Crying is their way of calling out. These babies, however, had been in abusive situations. Their parents let them cry for hours, never responded. Do you know what happened? After a long time, the babies stopped crying. It was almost as if they knew it just wasn't worth it. So the Menninger Institute came in to do an experiment. They collected people from retirement homes and even nursing homes. And every day these people came, held the babies, and rocked them. The object was to see if they could get the babies crying again. And you know, it worked. Physical touch made the difference. As important as physical touch is, there is yet another kind of touch that's even more important and it's called spiritual touch. This is the special touch that influences a person and impacts their lives. The telephone company, you may have heard the slogan a long time ago and recall it, they said, remember, reach out and touch someone? I went to where I really knew the people, 
I got the table I was sitting at after the di dinner was over, and everyone was asked to take off one shoe. And we held our shoe to our ear, and we sang that little chorus, I just called to say I love you, to the bride and the groom. Powerful, powerful words. Thank you to the bell company. Even though we sing those words, what they're really referring to is a meaningful relationship. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been to California and seen the sequoia trees, known as redwoods, and they are truly spectacular. Some tower as much as 300 feet above the ground. What was interesting to see them and listen to the guide is that these towering trees usually have very shallow root systems and they spider out just under the surface of the ground to catch as much as the surface moisture as they can. And this is their vulnerability. Storms with heavy winds would almost <coughs> always bring these giant trees crashing to the ground, but it rarely happens because they grow in clusters. And in their intertwining roots, surprise, provide support for one another against the storms. That's sort of what God asks us to do as a family or a church family. Provide a support for each other. Let our roots grow together in a way that we're one and yet individual all at the same time. Not everybody enjoys touch. Some crave it, but for a little period of time they just can't seem to find it. Today is the beginning of Pride Sunday at Birchcliff Bluffs United Church. And we understand pain and suffering come to all of us. So today I want to remember Toby's place and Dorothy's place in Scarborough. I recently received a video about Toby's place. And what was important to me was listening to the voices of our youth breaking bread together, exploring their sexuality, sharing their happenings of the week, shopping in the boutique for free clothes and houseware, the fun questions they asked each other each week. An example for you, and I must say I couldn't answer it for myself at that time. And the question they asked each other was, if you were pasta, what kind would you be? And once you figure out what kind of pasta you'd be, what kind of sauce would you put on you? They have workshops on self-identity and they openly and honestly try to help each other figure out who am I. Toby's place, many, many of the people present said for them it's a place to be, to be accepted, to be respected. They have a fun time with a music group that gets together with guitars. Some sing, and I hope they don't quit their day jobs. <laughs> but in the whole video I saw, respect was the key. Someone asked one of the participants, while you're figuring out your own personal identity, what's the biggest struggle of all? And you know what they said? Telling our parents. Can you imagine your son or your daughter coming with this confused burden and you either don't want to listen or you want to judge? Where is Christ in that kind of approach? What was important for me 
in watching the video of Toby's place was seeing that, even though they wouldn't say it the way I say it, they realize they're not alone. A bigger power walks with them, and they're doing their best to try and connect with it. They're doing the best to try and find someone who is willing to touch them, to hold them, to keep them from being destroyed or destroying themselves. Friends, we need to know that the roots of other people's lives are intertwined with ours. And how we respond is so important. I've never really believed that Bible studies and worship services in a church are nearly as important as nurture is. Programs are not designed to be an end in themselves. These things are equipped to equip us and energize us to go out and touch the lives of the people. I believe that as a family of God, we are called upon to reach out and touch the lives of the least, the last, the lonely, and the lost. Why do I feel that way? Because. What we have to do is really open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts if we're going to feel and recognize God's touch. I leave you with a story that I learned, well, it turns out 27 years ago, but powerful story. It's about a young couple who lived in the States and had a four-year-old son. They were trying very hard to have another child. And the day came when the mother was able to come home and say, we are going to have a baby in nine months. Everybody was excited. To the four-year-old, nine months meant nothing. And so every day he started looking for this new baby. He wanted to know, would it be a boy or a girl? Mom didn't know and didn't want to know until they got the baby. And so she started explaining to him how the baby was growing in her tummy and how big it was, and she tried to make it as real for him as she could. And every afternoon, they'd sit on the sofa, she'd tell him a little baby story, and then he'd put his hand on her tummy, and she would put her hand on, and they would sing together. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. For nine months, she told stories and they sang the little song. And finally, the day come when mother was rushed to the hospital and the little boy to grandma's. And he was told, when mom comes home, we're going to have the baby. Mom delivered a little girl. But the baby wasn't well. There was something wrong with the baby's heart. So the baby had to be kept in an incubator for at least a week. And the doctors were very honest and said, I don't know if you'll ever take this baby home. Mom went home heartbroken and tried to explain that to a four-year-old who's been waiting for this baby. And so finally the little guy said, Mom, I want to see my baby sister. Well, you're too little. You're not allowed in the hospital. And so he'd spend the day with Grandma and she'd go and visit the baby. And every day the baby seemed to be losing ground. And finally, the nurse said, we'll give the baby 24 hours. Mom went home, and of course, the little guy said, I want to see my sister, Mom. And she made a decision. 
she decided that if that baby was not coming home, then her brother was going to see her at least once. Next day, she took the little guy to the hospital. She was told he wasn't allowed in, and she just got her back up and said, he has a new little sister that's not going to be coming home. He needs to see her. They made allowances, allowed him into the prenatal unit, and the little guy went up, and the baby's in an incubator. And so the nurse comes and says, would you like to touch your sister, just gently? Oh, yes. And so he stuck his little hand in the hole in the side of the incubator and held her hand. True story. Holding her hand and looking at her, he started to sing. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. The nurse heard the machine start beeping and the lines were wiggling and she came over and looked and she said, keep singing, Timmy, keep singing. And so he went on, you make me happy when skies are gray. The baby's little heart took on a natural rhythm. The baby started to breathe by herself. The little guy finished, you never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. Suffice it to say, the end of the story is, it took three days. The baby was taken out of the incubator and was brought home. And I'm happy to tell you today, she's a 28-year-old, thriving young lady. Don't ever, ever let anybody tell you there's no power, no healing power in touch. You just need to believe. Let those who have ears hear, understand, and accept what God has to say to us. And I've mixed up my pages, but I know we're supposed to do offering. Oh, we're going to do a hymn first. Right on. Thank you. I'll, I'll find the right page. offering is indeed being received as you come into the sanctuary in the plate on the table. No words? There we are. And now for anniversary is the time to reflect on God's blessing to us. 
we have been blessed with so many gifts on our spiritual journey. The Holy Spirit lifts our hearts with hope and our voices in glad dedication as we present our offerings. Amen. And now, friend, God wants to be one with us, and so we share in a time of communion. God is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy mystery, that is holy love. You are beyond complete knowledge, above perfect description, Trinity, three in one, source of life, living word, and bond of love. You are creative and self-giving, generously moving. In all the near and distant corners of the universe, nothing exists that does not find its source in you. Even when we turn away from you, you are with us. Your presence never fails us. We praise you for Jesus Christ, eternal as your love, our bond to one another. We rejoice with all your people of every time and place, with the angels and archangels, to proclaim the glory of your name. It is Jesus, God incarnate, the risen Christ, who joined together as a communion of broken but hopeful believers, loving what he loved, living what he taught, and striving to be his faithful servants in our time and place. In this meal, we remember Jesus, his promises, and the price he paid for who he was, what he said, and what he did. On the night before he died, he took a piece of bread, broke it, gave thanks, and said, Take and eat. Whenever you do this, remember me. After supper, he took a cup. Remember, this is the new covenant. When you drink of it, remember me. We do remember. We remember his life of love, his friendship, his teaching, his dying, and his rising to life again. May the power of the Spirit bless this bread and cup, the wheat and the grape, the farmer and the harvest, the seed and the sower, so that in the sharing of these simple elements in community, we may taste and see their goodness, so that we might catch a glimpse of what is to be communion with you and with one another. Will the servers please come forward? Friend, the table is set and open to anyone who chooses to share. Come, for all is ready.
Thank you to our servers and to the participants. We now, friends, come to the best part of the service, the part where you are called to shut your mind off from the world around you just for a moment, bow your head and let God, through the power of the Spirit, talk to you. God wants to know what's going on in your heart and your mind, that God can be an active piece of who you are. So we pray. We are your people, gracious God. We affirm that basic creed of faith with our words and actions. We want to continue to make a difference to those needs around us. We ask love one another and recommit to your truth. May we embrace the challenges to come before us and meet the needs that surround us everywhere. In all we do and wherever we go, be with us, guiding and encouraging us. Come, come and show us the way our paths should go and the truth we should know. Come and help us to be a part of your healing touch in this hurting world. Come, come and use us let us use the gifts we have God-given that we might touch others and they might know beyond a shadow of a doubt they are not alone. Let them feel the moment of your healing touch with them at this time and place we ask. For we ask it in the name of Jesus the Christ who taught all believers when they prayed together to use the words Jesus taught, singing, Now, friends, our time indeed has come to an end, and so we stand and sing the closing hymn for this morning.
With deep love, we have been Christ's presence in this time and place. In faith, we, we have served this community and our country. Our country. May God bless all that lies ahead of us. Amen. Amen.